And it is time for us to begin with our next class in Bible prophecy. First, we want to begin with a word of prayer. Let's bow together. Father, as we come before you tonight, we want to pray that in these next three class times, that you will make your presence so real. The throne of your Son, which we are approaching right now in prayer, so real that there is no doubt in any of our minds of the fact that you are coming and you are coming soon. We pray, Father, that you would just make it real in our hearts and minds that soon Jesus is going to appear in the clouds. Those of us who know him are going to be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. And Father, we pray that, as you've told us to, that you would even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray that as many people taking this course, uh, there's the matter of fatigue of body and mind that fights against a clear understanding. We pray that your Holy Spirit would overcome those things, that our hearts would be open to your teaching, to your word, to your truth, that the Holy Spirit would put his hand and his touch on this teacher so that all that is spoken would be of you and for you. And we pray all of this in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. We are going to pick up where we left off in our last lecture, but in order to do that, I want to just back up in your minds just for a moment uh, to page 21. And if you will remember, we are looking at the different views of the rapture, the different views of the rapture. We saw that there was the false view that the rapture and the second coming are one and the same event. We saw a lot of reasons why those are definitely two distinct Bible events. Then we saw the false view uh, that the rapture is going to take place and only those who are spiritual are going to be caught up. Uh, some Christians will be left behind, uh, but Christians who aren't watching and looking and waiting, uh, they will be left. Those watching and looking and waiting, they'll be taken out. Then we saw the view of the mid-tribulational rapture, that Jesus would return in the rapture at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now on our chart up here, this is the tribulation period from this blue line to this blue line, and there's a line right down the middle because a lot of very significant events take place at the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, the one specifically mentioned on this card is this is or this chart is this is the point where Satan is finally cast down onto earth and he begins to go into great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time left to try to tempt and to destroy. Now the mid-trib rapture view says that Jesus returns at this point and raptures out the saints. The post-tribulational rapture view is the one we're looking at now. It says that Jesus will appear at the end of the tribulation to catch up the saints and that then basically they will come on down with the Lord uh, back to earth uh, to set up and establish a 1,000 year kingdom if they are a premillennialist or simply to wrap things up uh, if they're an amillennialist and they don't believe that there is going to be a literal millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Uh, the post-tribulational rapture view is what we were looking at at the bottom of page 21 is where you saw that introduced. I'm just getting you back in the flow of the outline. We saw the problems with this view that we've already covered on page 22, letter A, that this view denied the doctrine of imminency, the idea that Jesus may return at any moment. And then we saw letter B that it denies the distinctions between the rapture and the second coming, making them one and the same event, although we saw many distinctions in Scripture. Then we saw that this view denies the literal method of interpreting Scripture. Now many who believe in a post-tribulational rapture would be upset that you accused them of that. But the truth is that in many, many, many a discussion I've had over the years with those who believe in a mid-trib and a post-trib position, when I would say, what about this scriptural event? What about this scripture? What about this passage? The answer again and again and again turns out to be, well, that only contradicts it if you take that literally. How do we know that's a literal event? How do we know that's literal? And so what happens here is that the passages that disagree tend to be spiritualized away. Uh, the events that we talked about, the sheep-goat judgment is often spiritualized away as not being a literal judgment. Uh, Matthew 25 tells us about that judgment of the sheep and the goats. It's a very real judgment. The length of the tribulation is often said to be uh, something that isn't actually going to be seven years, even though the Bible told us how many years 
years. It told us how many months. It told us how many days. And God said it again and again. I think God made it very clear how long it's going to be. Daniel's 70th week is often spiritualized away. God's promises to Israel of a restoration that will take place because of a repentance that takes place during this time is often spiritualized away. Uh, many of the judgments of the tribulation are said not to be as severe as they appear when you first read them in Scripture. Then letter D, this view denies the distinction between tribulation in general and the seven-year tribulation in particular. I have often heard an argument used by post-tribulationists to say that we pre-tribbers are, you know, so uh, uh, vain in thinking that while Christians have been suffering martyrdom and torture and tribulation for the last 2,000 years, why should we think that we're going to escape from tribulation? Well, folks, there's a big difference between tribulation in general and the seven-year tribulation. I do not think the Bible promises us that we will escape tribulation in general with a little t. In fact, the Bible promises just the opposite, that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. We will go through tribulation. We will go through suffering. Uh, that's a guaranteed thing of Scripture. That has nothing to do with the seven-year tribulation. In fact, that's something that I think it's very important for us to remember. I often hear Christians who do believe in a pre-tribulational rapture say, we don't have to worry about another war or the collapse of the United States or anything like that. We don't have to worry about martyrdom coming because none of that will happen until after the rapture. Where does the Bible promise that judgment will not fall on the United States of America or any other country before the rapture? It never promises that. In fact, Chinese Christians believe that no judgment would ever come on them, no martyrdom or suffering or persecution would ever come on them uh, because the rapture would come before the tribulation. And then when the communist revolution took place and their churches were burned, uh, their pastors were tortured, uh, many were martyred for their faith, many Christians were very confused and very upset because they thought God had promised this would never happen. God has never promised us that we will escape tribulation, suffering, or martyrdom. If America continues to go down the path and road of sin, America may well see judgment come before the tribulation ever begins. So we do understand that distinction between tribulation in general and the seven-year tribulation. Letter E, this view, the post-trib rapture view, denies the true nature of the tribulation as a period of the outpouring of God's wrath on sin. I'd like for us to look uh, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to see a promise that God has given us in verse 10. We'll just take and look at that one verse. And then don't close your Bible when we read it because we're going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 10 says that we are to be waiting and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now I want you to get that. We have been delivered from the wrath which is to come. Now look to chapter 5 and verse number 9. And guess what we find there? In chapter 5 and verse number 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but rather to obtain salvation. Now the key to this is to understand that every chapter of 1 Thessalonians is about the rapture. Every chapter of 1 Thessalonians talks about the rapture and he continually promises we're going to escape the wrath to come. Back in the book of Romans, you don't have to turn there, but in chapter 5 and verse number 9, by the way, that's an easy way to remember, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, Romans 5.9, both promise that Christians are going to escape wrath. And it says, much more then, now being saved or justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So Christians are saved, delivered, not appointed to the wrath of God, the wrath to come. Now why is that significant? Because when we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and if you'll turn there with me right quickly, Revelation chapter 6, guess what the period known as the tribulation is referred to by the Word of God. In Revelation chapter 6, verse number 17, we are in the tribulation. At this point, the tribulation has really started in chapter 6, verse number 1, the first judgment of the tribulation. 
is poured out. We are in the seal judgments at this point in time. And in verse 17 of Romans, or Revelation 6, we read, For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Look to chapter 11 and verse number 18. Chapter 11 and verse number 18. And it tells us as we're again in the tribulation, we are enduring the judgments of the tribulation, and we read in chapter Number 11, verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. What is the entire point of the tribulation? The tribulation is the day of God's wrath. The day of God's wrath being poured out on planet earth. Now if the Bible says that you are going to be delivered from the wrath to come, not just wrath in general, but the wrath to come, and the tribulation is the outpouring of God's wrath, then you are going to be delivered, thank God, from the tribulation. In fact, can I say one thing to those of you who may disagree and may hold a post-trib or a mid-trib position? I've discussed uh, these positions with a lot of different people who hold the three views, and the one thing that amazes me is the people who get upset that you're trying to convince them of a pre-trib rapture. Can I say this? If I believed in a mid-trib or a post-trib rapture and you were trying to convince me of a pre-trib rapture, I would hope you were right. I wouldn't be, go no, I wouldn't be getting mad at you. I'd be saying, show me more, show me more. I hope try convince me, please, from the Word of God because we need to believe what the Word says. But folks, I guarantee you this. God has promised us we are not going to be here for the period of His wrath, which is the great tribulation or the tribulation to come. Then we look and see, letter F, that this view denies the distinction between Israel and the church. It confuses God's programs for both and makes a very erroneous mistake. All throughout the book of Revelation, we find believers referred to. The elect, and other terms, for those who are saved. And so, what the post-tribulationist does is simply turns to the book of Revelation during the tribulation, and he will often show you all of the passages that refer to people who are believers, people who are the elect, people who are going to heaven. And he says there, that proves that the church is still here. But if you'll notice, it never says church. It never says anything that would be something that would narrow us down to the New Testament believers. In fact, all of the terms are terms that will refer to people who are saved after the church is long gone, people from Israel and people from a great multitude of all nations because many will be saved during the tribulation. So all of the Christians are taken out at the beginning of the tribulation, but then people get saved during the tribulation. So if you look in the tribulation, do you see believers? Of course you do. Does that prove a post-trib rapture? Of course it does not. Then we look and see letter G. This view, the post-tribulational rapture, like the mid-trib view, denies the completeness of Christ's work on the cross, demanding a seven-year Protestant version of purgatory in order to purify the church before it's called up to marry the bridegroom, the Lamb of God. You see, folks, we're not purified by suffering, but by His blood. We discussed that in our last lectures. Letter H, this view denies the distinction between the biblical trumpets and thus ends up defying any reasonable chronology of the tribulation. There are many trumpets referred to in the tribulation period and outside of the tribulation period. There are the seven trumpet judgments sounded by the Lord God or sounded by the angels sent from the Lord God. Now these trumpets that we find here on our chart and that we find in the book of Revelation are equated, when we come especially to the seventh, with the last trump. Now, they are equated with the last trump that is going to take place at the end of the tribulation period. And actually, there are many trumpets within Scripture. And when we take a post-trib view and we say this one has to be this one, we are misunderstanding that there is a clear distinction between these two trumpets. Now, let's just take and let's look to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. I am going to show you the passage that is used as the primary support by just the common person who believes a mid-trib or post-trib rapture view. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's a very simple thing. It really boils down to one word, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will just read verse 51 and 52 again about the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, folks, here's the argument. The last trump cannot occur before the seven trumps. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the last one. Okay? There would be seven more yet to come. Now, this we saw is often used by mid-tribulationalists uh, to say that at the midpoint, here we have the seventh trump, which is also the last trump. We saw there's a big problem for them because when we read about the second coming in Jesus' Mount Olivet Discourse Sermon in Matthew 24 and 25, we find out that after Jesus returns, a trumpet sounds. Okay? That's at the end of the Battle of Armageddon. That's after the seven years. So that gives the mid-tribulationists a big problem. Well, the post-tribulationist doesn't have a problem there at this point because he says, yes, of course, those are the same trumpet. There's the seventh trumpet at the very end. That's the same as the last trump. That's all the rapture. That's the entire argument that they would give. However, they assume that this is the only possible interpretation. And you'll often hear it laid out like this. He says it's the last trump, therefore it has to be the last trump, and that settles it. Okay? And how do you argue with someone when they're talking like that? But wait a minute. Let's just stop for a moment and say, how do you interpret words in the Bible in the same way that you interpret words in ordinary, plain, normal language. That's the literal approach to understanding the scriptures. You don't look for some distinct different meaning. You look for what is the plain language say. Well, they say, well, the plain language of last means last. Notice this. Notice the interpretation they put in and they don't even see it. And let me show you a danger here. We often read a scripture and we read something into it and we don't even know we've read something into it. So we assume that's what it says. Someone else reads it the same passage, they read something else into it. And they say, that's what it says. You both put something into it that the other one didn't see. Now, it's very easy to do that, isn't it? In normal, everyday conversation. Um, Johnny Hayden is one of our members here at our church, and he teaches uh, sometimes our couples. And he shared an interesting story about his wife walking out the door one day and she pointed at the table, uh, a table they'd had for a long time, right by the door that they kept little, uh, you know, the mail and different things like that on. And uh, she pointed that and said, would you get rid of that? Would you throw that away from me today? And he said, why, of course. And uh, so she leaves and he takes and he throws away the table just like she asked. Okay. Now she comes home and goes, where's my table? And he goes, well, I threw it away just like you asked me to. What's wrong? She goes, you threw away the table? I meant throw away the stuff on the table. Now, she pointed and said, throw that away. They both read it completely differently. Both understood it completely differently. Now, let me show you what the post-tribulationalist is reading into this passage. Back to verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet which ever shall sound for all of time didn't say all that, did it? All it said was last trump. You say, well, last does mean last whichever shall be for all time, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. In ordinary, normal language, does it? Let me give you some examples. How often have you heard of someone who was out because that was their last strike? Which obviously means the last strike whichever shall be for all time. There will never be another ball game. There will never be another pitch. There will never be another batter. There will never be another inning. Baseball is over for all of eternity because that was the last strike. And when there's the last out, that obviously means baseball is over for all of eternity, does it not? Because it must mean the last whichever shall be for all time. But wait a minute. When we say last in normal language, is that what we mean? When we say the last inning, do we not mean the last inning of that game? not the last inning of all eternity. When I say that last night in class, we spoke about some particular subject, do I mean that last night was the last night whichever shall be for all of eternity and before it's not quite dark yet, before it gets dark tonight, uh, that time will cease to be? I don't think so. When I say that I saw you last week, 
Do I mean that there will never be another week for all of eternity? When I say something happened last month, do I mean that was the last month of all eternity? Or last year? Or the last time I saw you? Or if something happened at the last minute? Or at the last second? Does the last second mean that there will never be another second for all of eternity? How about the last bell? Or the last class? Every day there's a last bell, isn't there, in school? Every day there's a last class. Tonight there will be a last class. We'll have the last class tonight in our third hour, and then we'll have class again next week. Last in normal language usually refers to last in a series of things, not the last which ever shall be for all of eternity. In normal language, last means the most recent, the last in a series of events, the latest possible opportunity, the conclusion of a program. It can mean any of those different things. So how do we know which of those is meant by this passage? Well, the test is very, very simple. You let the context and you let comparing Scripture with Scripture answer that question for you. Now, let's look at that just for a moment. First, number two. The argument that the last trump must be the absolute last trump which ever sounds for all of eternity forces post-tribulationists to identify the last trump of the rapture with the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation and with the trumpet which gathers saved tribulation survivors after the second coming. There are those three distinct trumpets. Now, this is going to create several problems. Number three, this is absolutely impossible that these are the same event in light of the fact that it allows no interval whatsoever for the series of the seven bowl or vile judgments. Now, let me step to my chart and show you what I'm talking about. Seven angels will come with seven vials. They'll pour them out in judgment on the earth. What then do we find as a problem here? Well, let's just look right up here at the chart and go ahead and switch back to me, Linda, so they can see this. And uh, let me show you where our problem is. We have the seals first, we have the trumpets next, and the seventh trumpet is said to contain and unleash the seven vial or bowl judgments. If this seventh trumpet is the same trumpet that occurs at the Battle of Armageddon when Jesus returns, then where did these judgments fit in? There's no place for them. In fact, that trumpet sounds after actually Jesus has actually returned, so there's no possibility that the seven vials can fit in there. There's no place for them to occur. Now, how do they answer that? Every time I've ever asked someone that question, they've always ended up doing, guess what? Saying, well, you can't take this as a literal chronology. You can't take this as occurring in the order that it does. Maybe it all overlaps. Maybe it's all, and, and instead of just saying, hey, let's let the plain sense say it, you come up with problems. There's no place for the bowl judgments. Number, or letter B, it identifies the rapture with the seventh trumpet. Now, there is a big problem here. Let me show it to you. The rapture occurs before the second coming according to this view. Now, what do we mean by that? Jesus returns in the clouds, the trumpet sounds, believers are caught up with him, all right? Then Jesus descends at the Battle of Armageddon and conquers and wipes out the Antichrist and all of his forces. But then, if you read closely in Matthew 24, when Jesus outlines these events, then the trumpet sounds. Wait a minute. You can't have, it's not a, a long time period, but you can't say that the trumpet is right before Jesus comes and defeats the Antichrist and right after. Which is it? It's one or the other. If you're going to say it's the last one which ever shall be for all time and we find a trumpet after Jesus returns in Matthew 24, then guess what? The rapture can't happen until after Jesus has already come. So how are we coming with Him? Which they say we come with Him because they say we get called up Okay, then we come down with him. But if he's already down before he ever calls us up, we didn't come with him. Okay, and so how do you get around that? Well, you have to say again that chronology there that Jesus lays out isn't meant to be taken that seriously or that literally. I take it seriously. I take it literally. Now, it can't be before and after. The scripture clearly teaches that Jesus comes for his saints at the rapture and with his saints at the second coming. Now, the post-tribulationist, as I just laid out, has an answer for that. He says that the trumpet sounds, we're called up. All right? Jesus 
unveils himself in all his glory in the air. Every eye shall see him, and then we come down with him. So what do we do in this view? I'm going to walk over to the board here as we've got our rapture positions laid out. The pre-trib rapture, the mid-trib rapture, the post-trib rapture. I want you to notice the arrows and how we've drawn them here. In the pre-trib rapture, Jesus comes to the clouds and then we go up with him to heaven. In the mid-trib rapture, Jesus comes to the clouds and then we go up with him to heaven. In the post-trib rapture, Jesus comes to the clouds, then we go up with him, and then we come right back down to him. We never make it to heaven. All we ever make it to is the clouds, and then we come back down to the earth. What's the problem? The first passage we showed you about the rapture in the New Testament is John chapter 14, where Jesus said that if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What place is he talking about? He just said it. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. Where do we go at the rapture? Up to the clouds and back down to earth? No. At the rapture, we don't go up and come down. We go up and head on up. And we're going to spend the next seven years in glory, not back down immediately on earth. So that's a problem for the post-tribulational rapture view. The whole point of the rapture is to get us to heaven, and we never even get there at that point in time by this view. So we see that we're called to heaven, and that gives us a problem. Also, like we just pointed out, this trumpet sounding after gives a problem for the up and down view because he would already be down before we ever went up. And if he's already down, how are we meeting him in the clouds when he's already got his feet down on the Mount of Olives? Okay, And I'm combining several scriptures there, but I, I think that gives you uh, a problem, uh, at least an uh, ability to understand their problem. At the top of page 25, we read that it is inconceivable to think that after the second coming of Jesus, there never will be a trumpet which ever sounds for all of eternity. Especially in light of the fact that the Bible does tell us that such events as the Feast of Tabernacles will be observed in the millennium. And when you read in the commandments of God about the Feast of Tabernacles, guess what it contains? The sounding of trumpets. Folks, I believe there's going to be trumpets and other instruments sounding in heaven for all of eternity. The last trump does not mean the last whichever shall be for all of eternity. Now, if it doesn't mean that, then a good question is, what does the last trump mean? Well, that's number four, the meaning of the last trump. Since the word last attached to the phrase last trump does not and cannot mean the last whichever shall occur for all time, then what does it mean? The following have been suggested to explain this, and we'll just give them all to you, and I think that you're going to find that this makes a, a lot more sense than the last of all time. First, since last, last strike means the conclusion of a batting time. A last inning, uh, that's a conclusion of a game. Last out, that's a conclusion of an inning. Last also mean, often means the conclusion of a thing. Well, at the last trump, that is the conclusion of the church age. The church began with Jesus Christ as he called out his church. And now the church will end when it is raptured out to meet the Lord in the air. The conclusion of the church age, that is. The church won't end, the church age will end. Dwight Pentecost in his book, Things to Come, writes, The word last may signify that which concludes a program, but is not necessarily the last that will ever exist. Now look down to number two. Uh, Thiessen, the theologian, quotes Ellicott in his book, Will the Church Pass Through the Tribulation? The salpix, which is the word for the trumpet here, the apostle here terms eschata, or last, that's where we get eschatology from that same word, as connected with the close of this age. Thiessen concludes there is no ground for identifying the trump in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 with the seventh trumpet. What is he saying? It means last because it concludes this age. Secondly, the last trumpet is a signal for the people of God to move out. Now, where do we get that from? Both Jewish in, Ro in Numbers chapter 10 and Roman tradition called for a series of calls or a series of trumpets for the congregation to assemble and get ready. And there was always the Jews referred to a last trump, the Romans referred to a last trump, and both meant that it was time for the assembly to be set in motion. 
Now, what do we mean by that? In the wilderness, the law of God gave three trumpets to be sounded to Israel. The first trump, you've got two and a half million people in the desert, and you're going to move them. They've been camped there maybe for six months. Do you just sound a trumpet and say, everybody start walking? No, you need to pack. You need to get the kids together. You need to get the livestock ready. So there was a trumpet that said, we'll be leaving soon. There was a second trumpet that said, okay, you've got everything packed, you're ready. Now there was a prescribed order in Scripture. Uh, this tribe had to be first, this tribe next, and all the tribes had to get up in order. The second trumpet meant get in line. And the last trumpet meant move out. Okay? Well, guess what the rapture is telling us? Move out. Okay? The last trumpet. To the Romans, it meant move out. The last trumpet meant it's time to go. And to the Jews, it meant it's time to go. Do we find anything like that here about the rapture? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, guess how many signals we get? There are two calls. There is the Lord shout, there's the voice of the archangel, and there's the last trump, a series of three, just like in the Old Testament. English quotes Amerding in the book Rethinking the Rapture with these words. The last trump would signify that the whole congregation was finally on the move. It will be the nature of an alarm, which is the very word used in Numbers 10, 5, and 6 in connection with the journeyings of the camp. The quickening, and that is being made alive, the resurrection, and assembling already accomplished, the former by the voice of the Lord, the latter by the voice of the archangel. There is only one more thing necessary to set all in motion. It is the last trump, the final note struck on that momentous occasion. Now, let me try to put that together for you simply. We have three things that have to happen. The departed saints come with Jesus in the clouds, their spirits. So then we have the voice of the Lord. Guess what happens at the voice of the Lord? The bodies are resurrected. You see, an angel can't say to the dead to get up, but the Lord can. The Lord's the one who does resurrections. And the dead rise. And then there's the shout of the archangel. Guess when we get to go up. Okay? This is when we find the next event take place, and then there's that trumpet that says, let's move out. We go. Now, we take and we turn the page and we see that often in the Old Testament and to the Jews, the last trumpet also signified the last trumpet of warfare. And this could be, it's been suggested, the last trumpet in reference to the last trumpet of our warfare. The Salpix was a war trumpet. It was often sounded in war like the cavalry would sound the charge. It had several distinct meanings. The Jews sounded one trumpet that said prepare for battle. Another signaled the attack. Still another signaled pursuit or ambush and of the slain in battle. The last trumpet signaled the, get this, the last trumpet in war signaled the end of all their battles and the command to reassemble before their captain, before their king, and to be sent home. That's how the Jew understood the last trumpet. Stop and think that through. We've been in battle. And then there's a trumpet that says, your battles are over. Gather before the captain of the host and go home. That's what's going to happen at the rapture. All our struggles and battles with sin are over. We gather before the captain of the host and we get to go home to glory. Now, the Jews called these the trumpets of return and actually wrote the words, the gathering of God on these trumpets that would be sounded to mean it's time to return from the war. Paul and his Jewish readers may well have had this familiar picture in mind when he wrote of the last trump. Now then, the last trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is universally almost understood to be a picture of the rapture. This annual Jewish feast was celebrated with a series of short trumpet blasts concluding with a long trumpet blast which was called Tekaya Gedola, or the great trump, or the last trump. The Jews universally connected this last trump of the Feast of Trumpets with the resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is comparing the resurrection, in 1 Corinthians 15 in particular, Paul is comparing the resurrection 
and the Jewish feast. When we go all the way back to chapter number 5, we find that the first Jewish feast was Passover. Now, Passover, for those of you here live, was just two weeks ago. Okay? Or excuse me, that was Pentecost two weeks ago. Passover then uh, 50 days before that. What happened at Passover? The blood above the door to the side post, the Jewish feast of Passover. What did Passover picture? The shedding of the blood of the Lamb. Jesus was put to death on the day of Passover. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says the first feast, Passover, pictured Christ's death. Now, the second feast, we come all the way to chapter 15, was the feast of first fruits. In chapter 15, Paul connects that and says that's a picture of Christ's resurrection. First we have Christ's death, then we have Christ's resurrection, pictured by the second feast. The third feast, the Feast of Weeks, is also known as the Feast of Pentecost. Well, what does Pentecost obviously represent? The coming of the Spirit after the resurrection. Then the fourth feast is the Feast of Trumpets, which is universally acknowledged to picture the rapture. How did the Feast of Trumpets end? With the last trump that meant it was time for the resurrection. That's how the Jew understood it. Now, what feast came next to the Jew? The Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, which was a day for the nation to suffer and fast and mourn and for sin to be dealt with. This was the day on which the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood in the holy place on the mercy seat, putting off the judgment of Israel for one more year. This pictures the tribulation. And then finally, there's the Feast of Tabernacles where the people would come and they would gather to Jerusalem and dwell in Jerusalem in tabernacles before the presence of the Lord, which pictures the millennium. Now, notice the flow of events. The first feast was Passover. That pictured Christ's death, according to Paul. The second feast was first fruits. That pictured Christ's resurrection, according to Paul. The third feast was the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, that obviously pictures the coming of the Spirit that occurred on Pentecost. The fourth feast, trumpets, pictures the rapture. And then the Feast of Atonement pictures the tribulation. Look at the order. You have the rapture, then the tribulation, and then what's next? The millennium. Okay, according to the Jewish feast, it all fits perfectly with that. And how was the resurrection pictured in the mind of the Jew? The last trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets. Now then... Next we see that this also signifies the last trump of God. I want you to just notice something here, and we'll see it a little bit later in the notes, but I want to go ahead and point it out now. In 1 Corinthians 15.52, we read of the last trump. When we read of this trump and we compare that with over in 1 Thessalonians 4, we find the last trump, it says the trumpet of the what? Boy, I don't have that memorized yet, do you? The trumpet of the what shall sound? The trumpet of the Lord. Who is the trumpet of the rapture sounded by? To whom does this trumpet belong? It is the trumpet of God. Now, when we look at the seven trumpets, we'll see this in the book of Revelation. Guess who sounds each of those trumpets? Angels. There's a difference between a trumpet of angels and a trumpet of God. This is the trump of God, not one of the trumps of angels. Now that's an important distinction. But I want us to go further. This last trump is the last trump of God as compared with the first trump of God. Did you know that God has sounded a trumpet before? Well, let's just take and uh, let us give the thought flow of what has happened here. In fact, let me just let me give it and then I'll go through the notes here. The trumpet of God, in fact, I want you to do this. Look down to number 5, and I'm going to come back to numbers 1 through 4. Look down to number 5 on page 27. And we read there, of the trump of God, this is the last trump, this last trump is the trump of God. So that brings us to a question, where is the first trump of God found? If I want to understand the last trump of God, maybe I ought to look at the first trump of God, and then it'll start to make sense. Where is the first trump of God found? Most of us have never heard this before. The answer is at Mount Sinai, at the giving of the law to Moses. This, in fact, happens to be the first trumpet ever sounded in Scripture. There are many biblical trumpets in between this first trump and last trump, 
which are sounded by men. There are many Bible trumpets sounded by angels, but there are only two trumpets in the Bible sounded by God. One at Mount Sinai, one at the rapture. Now, what is the picture here? God is saying at the last trump, the trump of God, as compared in a series of things, first and last. First and last. Now, you've got to follow me here a little bit. This is a little complex, but you're going to see it's great when we get to the conclusion. I'll bother you with the recipe, then I'm going to give you the cake and the frosting in a second. Number one, the whole subject of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul calls this the last trump, is the resurrection. Now, Paul has been contrasting two things through the whole chapter. The two things are death and life. Death and and life. All through 1 Corinthians 15, he's contrasting death and life. The first Adam brought death. The second Adam will bring life. In Christ, there's life. In Adam, there was death. In fact, he's also contrasting the first Adam who brought death and the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus, who brought life. So he's contracting, contrasting death and life. First Adam, last Adam. Now then, he now mentions a last trump, which we are now in a thought flow, if you're reading 1 Corinthians 15 through, of there's something that brought death, something that brought life. There was the first Adam, there was the last Adam. Now we come to the last trump. You know what my mind immediately goes to? If we've got first and last, life and death, if this is something that brings life, if this is something that is last, well, what was the first thing that brought the death? All right? Now, number seven. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56, Paul declared that sin causes death and the strength of the death causing sin was the law. That's what Paul says in this context. The law that God gave to Israel where? At Mount Sinai, when the first trumpet sounded. Now, let me lay it out for you under number 8. The first trump of God was sounded at Mount Sinai, and let me give you the picture. Moses was told, put up barriers all of the way around the mountain so that no one can approach to the mountain. Any man or any beast that approaches the mountain will die. And Moses went up the mountain and God said, Moses, go back down the mountain and tell them not to come on this mountain or they will die. And Moses said, Lord, you already told them we already put barriers. He said, I don't care. Go back down and tell them don't approach this mountain lest you die. Moses goes back down the mountain and says, don't approach the mountain. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, don't approach the mountain. Moses goes up the mountain. And what happens? God descends from heaven in clouds and in fire and in thunderings and in lightnings and in great shakings. Then a trumpet sounds from heaven, a long trumpet blast, the trump of God. What is this trumpet sounded to do, Israel is told, when you hear the trumpet, gather together. When you hear the trumpet, the trumpet forbid anyone from approaching to God's glory. They were to gather at the base of the mount because God was coming down, but they weren't to approach to His glory. They were, the trumpet was to forbid anyone from coming into His presence. This trumpet gave the law that began death. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is saying there's a resurrection brought by the last Adam, that's brought by the new covenant, not the old covenant, given on Mount Sinai at the first trump of God that brought death, that brought separation. There's a last trump that's bringing life, that's bringing reunion. Now let's contrast the last trump as it's given to us. Moses heard the trumpet when God descended in clouds of fire and glory. What's going to happen at the last trump of God? God is going to descend in clouds of glory. What happened next in the Old Testament at the first trump of God? The trumpet then sounded. What did the first trumpet do? In the first trump of God, the people of God were to gather at the base of the mountain when they heard the trumpet. What happens when the last trump of God sounds? The people of God are gathered together, not at the foot of the mountain, but in the air. The first trumpet of God was sounded to forbid anyone from approaching the glory of God. The last trump of God is sounded to invite us to come into and to share and partake of the glory 
of God. The last trumpet was to forbid anyone from approaching, or the first trumpet of God forbid anyone from approaching God's presence. The last trump of God invites everyone who is a believer to come into God's presence. The first trumpet of God brought the law that brought the curse of death. The last trump of God is what removes the curse of death. In fact, let's look back at 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And let's just read how it flows on the thought after that. I show you, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, here it is, here's our conclusion, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? The law that was given at the first trump. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory over death, over hell, over the grave, over sin, over the curse, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to understand the last trump, my friend? Read about the first trump of God. One said, gather! God's coming down! Gather, but don't you approach my presence lest you die. Don't look on my glory lest you die. The last trump said, Gather, come into my presence, share my glory, and you will never, never, never die. Whew. If you don't get excited about that, something's wrong with you. I've got to stop right there and take a break. We'll meet you back for the next class.